Great. So as you can see, we are recording the event tonight. So if you miss part of it, um, if you need to hop off, if with the snowstorm you lose some power, no worries. Um, it will be up on our YouTube channel one week from today, maybe sooner. Um, but at least by next Thursday, it'll be on our YouTube channel for you to access at any time or share with friends. Um, I'm Avery Williams. I am head of marketing for Backyard ADUs. I do all the social media. If you get our newsletters, that is me behind the scenes. Um, we also have with us Jeff Bowman. If you've been to any of our past events, you recognize his face. He's a our small home advisor from Maine. So if you're located in Maine, um, you'll be working right alongside with Jeff on your project. Um, who isn't present tonight is Tim O'Reilly. He's our Massachusetts small home advisor. You'll see him in all of our past events if you do hop on our YouTube channel. And he is our small home advisor in Massachusetts. So if you are located there, um, he is your right-hand man. And then we also have special guests tonight. I like to call you that. Thanks, <laughs> um, no, Austin that. Gregory. He's our chief of operations and engineering, and he is our expert on all of the green things. Um, so he's going to be giving our presentation tonight. Um, and at the end, we will have the contact information also for Tim and Jeff for you to reach out to them if you have any specific questions that didn't get answered or that you think of later, um, or if you want to contact them in starting your project. And also, you will receive a follow-up email tomorrow. Um, any of the guides or resources or things that are mentioned um, throughout the presentation, I will compile all those for you. So don't worry about trying to find them or write them down. I will email all that information tomorrow morning. So great. Austin, if you want to take it away. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, April. And thanks everyone for coming or for watching after the fact. i um, super excited this April to do something like this. Um, I nerd out about it on a daily basis. Earth Month is every month uh, for me. So I'm super excited to share some of what we've learned as Backyard ADUs and some of what we implement. Um, so I'll hit the ground running. Please feel free to continue to ask questions. Um, we, we definitely want to answer those. Um, excuse me, get my toggle going here. All right, I'm going to start with this slide. What makes a home green? Everyone probably hears that a lot. It's kind of a key word nowadays, um, green or eco-friendly. Um, but these are kind of the things that we list that are important to make a home green or more energy efficient or better for the environment. Uh, the first thing is multi-use spaces that are sized just right. And I'll get into that a little bit more as I go through. Um, reducing our energy use, that's a big one, uh, through more efficient heating systems, better insulation, better air sealing, uh, and more efficient appliances. This is one that you probably see all the time because I think uh, it's easy for people to sell products with these listings. You know, that this will, this is a more efficient heating system. This will insulate your house better. This is a more efficient appliance. You see some of those. Um, so those ones are kind of easy to spot. Some that are less easy to spot are choosing better products that use less energy to make. Uh, this one is super complicated. Uh, it's called embodied carbon. And again, I'll get more into that, but this is the life cycle of a product. So from when you, from when it first is mined or cut down to when you use it, and then afterwards recycling it or uh, throwing it in a landfill, the amount of carbon it takes to actually um, perform that life cycle. Um, so that's a super important one that is a lot harder to see, but almost more important than a lot of the other things um, that I just talked about. The final items we'll hit on is uh, improved indoor air quality. Super important for a healthy home and uh, more efficient water usage. Um, so here, I'm gonna start with a few definitions. The first one is embodied carbon. So this refers to the amount of greenhouse gas emissions associated with upstream extraction, production, transport, and manufacturing stages of a product's life. Basically that means how much energy and carbon output does it take to actually create a product? Um, some products that are that are easy to see, uh, concrete requires heating up rocks at a really high temperature to extract um, what we need out of, out of those uh, elements. So to get Portland cement, it requires really high temperatures, which has a huge carbon footprint. And you might've seen that before, but concrete in general has a super high carbon footprint when it comes to the embodied carbon of concrete. 
I mean, there are other products like that, uh, but this is definition. Um, this is a nice chart that kind of shows what we mean by that. Um, you have the product phase where it's actually raw material is turned into products. Uh, we then transport things. Um, at that point, we actually use and maintain those items or homes in our cases. And then at the end of life, we have deconstruction and demolition, waste transport and processing. All of those things uh, take up, take a certain amount of uh, carbon or they produce a certain amount of carbon. And that's something we have to think about. It's super important. Uh, the next definition I'm gonna use throughout this presentation is diminishing returns. So uh, the idea behind diminishing returns is that you get smaller profits or benefits derived from something as more money or energy is invested in it. Um, we care about both of those things as we build both money and energy um, from an energy efficiency perspective. And then also from you know getting the most out of your money um, and making sure you insulate your house as best as possible, but also within reason. Um, so I'll be talking about diminishing returns a lot because we really believe in that. You know. Anyone can build a super efficient small home for millions of dollars, um, but we are trying to bring the cost down to something that is both energy efficient, but also doable for everyday people. Um, this is a nice graph that kind of shows that. Um, so this can apply to many things, but during the productive phase, you know, you're putting either more insulation in your walls and you're still getting a better return out of that. So you're holding more heat in or you're holding more air conditioning in or you're holding more heat out. Um, but eventually you reach that point of diminishing returns where you put money or insulation in and it's no longer making as big of a difference um, in those. And then with some things, you can actually get to negative returns. Uh, that's not really true with insulation itself, but from a cost perspective, eventually you can put so much money in that you're not saving enough heat energy where you're actually saving money, you're actually just spending it. Um, and that's important to think about as well. All right, final definition is efficiency. This one's important because when we talk about environmental efficiency or eco-friendliness or greenness, what we're really talking about is overall efficiency. There's efficiency associated with the embodied carbon. The more efficient the process is, um, generally the less embodied carbon you'll have. There's efficiency associated with heating your house, with cooling your house, with all of the activities that go on in your house, and even with building your house. So this is a really important thing to uh, know what it means. Um, and efficiency on a very technical level is the ratio of the useful work performed by a machine or in a process to the total energy expended or heat taken in. So it's work performed compared to the total energy expended or heat taken in. Um, so I'll leave you with that. All right, any any questions so far? If you haven't noticed, this is why I'm normally in the background. I get really deep into things and really nerdy. I'm trying to present it to you in a reasonable way. But again, please feel free to ask me questions. If I'm being too technical, let me know. Um, April, um, do we do have questions? a question. Um, one I think we'll get to later um, is about, is the ADU super insulated? Um, yeah. which we're going to talk about. And then can you pre-build location for battery storage? It's kind of specific for later, but that's the only question we have so far. Yeah, great question. Um, so I won't touch on this too much, but for battery storage, um, you can actually get external batteries that operate and you can hang them on the outside of your house. And we can certainly pre-wire for that. You can get internal batteries that you can hang on the wall on the inside. Generally, a battery is more efficient when it's kept at room temperature. Um, anyone who drives an EV would know that if it gets really cold or really hot, the EV loses its performance and loses its efficiency rating. Uh, but yeah, that's certainly something we do. We plan for things like solar or car chargers for future battery storage in our building. Um, and that's that's part of the cost part of this is we like to think about all those things in the future and know when it's cost effective to do all of that up front and to plan for it and when it might not be. Um, but for all of those things, it is typically more cost effective while we're building to run a conduit for solar in the future, even if you can't afford solar right now, to run a wire and an outlet for a car charger, even if you might not own an EV right now, uh, we're planning for that future possibility. Um, so yeah, we do that all the time. And on most of our houses, we are planning for all three of those things. So great question. Great. 
that's it for now. All right. <laughs> uh, this next slide is one of my favorite slides that we share. Um, so what this is representing is the average household size um, in terms of number of people. And that's the graphic at the at the bottom showing kind of those standardized people and um, you know how blue they are is the number of people. So it's, you know, for 2019, the average household size was two and a half. And then above that is the average building size or residence that they're living in. So you can look all the way back to 1790. And there were five and two thirds people on average uh, living in 831 square feet. That was that was that was typical. That was the median household size uh, and number of occupants. You can see from 1790 to 2019, we've actually gone up to two and a half occupants for almost 2,500 square feet, a massive increase in a relatively short amount of time over human history. Um, luckily, in the past five years, we've actually decreased that slightly. We're at about two and a half occupants for 2,300 square feet now. This graphic doesn't show that, um, which is actually pretty significant when you think about it. Um, but we are still way above what we were at in, in 1790. Now, I I personally don't want to live with five other people in an 830 square foot house. I'll admit that. Uh, but for me and my wife and our daughter, I, I, I do not want to live in a 2,500 square foot house. And we believe, you know, a, a healthy size for a family of that size is, is between 800 and 900 square feet. It might be lar a little bit larger for your family or a little bit smaller. Um, but we are really focused on making small spaces work uh, for people and their families, um, because small spaces are inherently more efficient. It's less space to heat. Um, it's less to clean, to maintain. Um, anything associated with a small space, is just it just happens to be more efficient. It's more efficient to build. So the embodied carbon is much smaller compared to a much larger structure. Anyone that's um, just joined us too, um, if you just want to, we have closed the chat off tonight, um, but there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. I know a few people just showed up. So if you have any questions throughout the presentation, just go ahead and leave it in that Q&A button and we'll make sure to get an answer for you. Awesome. Thank you, Avril. Um, okay. So associated with smaller buildings uh, is this concept of energy use per expected occupant. Um, so as home size per occupant has grown, so is energy usage. Like I said, that just makes sense. If your home is larger, you have more lights, you have more outlets, you have more things. Uh, you have more heat being used because it's a larger building. So despite us increasingly build building more efficiently, um, and we've done that since the 1980s, the homes have become more efficient with every new building code, um, our energy usage has still gone up. Um, some of that is technology has increased, but a lot of it is just because we have fewer occupants for larger spaces. So on a per occupant um from a per occupant perspective, our energy use has actually gone up. Um, so we we love this idea of backyard data use, that energy use per occupant, that's, what's, that's what we're focusing on. We're trying to bring down our energy use on a per occupant basis, because that's what we think is important. You can measure that as an individual, we can feel good about it, and we can say for every 100 people who live in a backyard ADU, we are at 10% of the normal energy usage of the standard human out in the world. Um, so that analysis encourages smaller dwellings with less volume to heat and cool. Unfortunately, traditional ratings uh, inadvertently make larger homes look more efficient. Um, how they do that is because normally they're using a denominator of square footage. So they're saying, oh, they're only using this much energy per square foot or this much energy per cubic foot. Um, and that looks really good on paper because when you have a 2,500 square foot house with two and a half occupants or a 900 square foot house with two and a half occupants, they both have a washer dryer. They both have a refrigerator. Um, they're all, you, you know, they both have a heating system, but when you increase that volume or that square footage so much, uh, it makes it look, look good on paper. We know that it's just not true. That's still worse for the environment because the overall energy usage in a large house is way more is magnitudes more than a small house. And that's why we focus on the energy use per occupant. All right, um, small does not mean compromise. Uh, if you are familiar with us, you know that our our slogan is build smart, build small. We, we really believe in this. Um, 
What we don't do is we tell you what small house that you should be in. And other people do that. Other companies do that. They'll design something that they think is perfect. And they'll say, hey, this is what you should be in. It's perfect. It's designed perfectly. We know that different people want different things. Uh, some examples of customizations we've made for people are a nook for a piano for an older lady who wanted her piano in her small house. Um, a nook for a, a desk. It was an old antique desk that somebody wanted. Maybe it's an heirloom a bookshelf that needs to fit. Um, and the benefit of working with someone like us is that we are going to design small, but we're going to ask you about those things. You know, if you have a nice dining room table from your grandma that needs to fit, we'll ask you to whip out your measuring tape, measure it, and we'll fit it into your floor plan. Um, so, you know, this heading here, small does not mean compromise. We, we firmly believe that. We're designing houses with full-size kitchens and bathrooms, including ADA accessible bathrooms and kitchens, um, separate sleeping and living spaces. You're not sleeping where it's not tiny house style where you're just lofted over your living room. It's not New York apartment style where your living room is your kitchen, is your dining room, is your office. Um, you know, we have fully separate sleeping and living spaces because we know that's something that people are used to. Um, Plenty of storage space. That's important in small homes. Uh, it can feel really cluttery if you don't have storage to put stuff away. And we we focus on that. We Closets in, it, in each room, at least. Pantries, um, making use of the space really well. And then multi-use spaces are super important. So being smart about using futons and pull-out beds um, and cabinets that can open and have all your yoga supplies in the same room that your office is in so that you can do yoga. Um, thinking about all of that upfront when you're building a house can make it that you, so that you can really reduce your space. You don't need to have a yoga room and an office and a guest room and a living room. Uh, you can combine a lot of those into, into one room and it's a great way to both save energy um, and also save upfront cost. And again, that's what we're all about. So I wanna show a quick example of our most typical build. This is called our L-Line. This is one of, I think we've done 30 variations of this, and this is one of them. But you can see we have two full bedrooms. This is only 810 square feet, two full bedrooms, a full bath um, that is almost ADA. It can be ADA in this footprint, um, just with a slight decrease in size of the kitchen. A full kitchen, including a full stove, a dishwasher, a sink, a full fridge. Um, you can see we have one, two, three, four, four closet spaces, all within that 810 square feet. Um, and uh, we have a full living room, full dining area, which can fit a two person table that can be pulled out for a four person table. It's a very comfortable floor plan. Um, and this is what I'm talking about. Small can be totally doable. And this, I think three occupants can easily live in this house, a couple and, and a child. Two people can as roommates. Um, we've seen lots of variations and it's a, again, small is a great way to save energy, uh, both from the upfront and body carbon perspective, as well as the lifetime energy. Uh, and it's totally doable and comfortable. All right, I'm gonna take another breath here. Looks like we might have another question, April. You're muted. You're muted. Sorry, yeah. Um, I think you're gonna go over it later, but um, out of curiosity, what HVAC systems do you use? Great question. Yeah, we use we exclusively use heat pumps. Uh, so we you're we're using high efficiency um, mini splits, um, which is a certain type of heat pump. But uh, we are using heat pumps. Sometimes they're ducted. Sometimes they're um, non ducted, like the head units you might have seen before. But all of our heating systems are heat pumps exclusively. Great question. I um, mean, I will go over that more on why we do that and why heat pumps are a good choice for heating. So this is another um, this is another part of building green, maximizing land use, minimizing impact. What that means is is that uh, we want to maximize land use. It's called urbanization or densification. Uh, where we are using more land that is already developed. Because if you have already developed land, you already have an environmental impact there. Um, most of the time, in, for instance, single family zoning in Portland, you'll have a house lot that has a house on it 
And it's got a bunch of land that was cleared from what it was originally. And now it's probably lawn, lawn and maybe a garage, maybe a large driveway. So it is better to use that piece of land from an environmental perspective than a raw piece of land with trees that you have to clear with some wetlands on one side of it that you have to impact um, with native vegetation that's already there. It is far less of an impact to use the grassed in land that has already been touched than it is to use the raw land. Um, and as backyard ADUs, you might have guessed that's that's what we believe and that's what we try to push is people putting ADUs or accessory dwelling units on land that is already developed and densifying that. Um, along with that, naturally, you're going to minimize your impact. Um, a lot of people that we build for, that we build ADUs for, they are joining family members or friends uh, on, on an adjacent property. So for instance, my mother lives in a in my sister's backyard, side yard right now. Um, and we have a lot of stories like that. What that means is in a lot of times you can share a vehicle. So instead of having a vehicle per occupant, you can maybe have two total vehicles that all family members can share. Uh, you can share garage and storage space. Um, instead of having two garages, you have one garage, which minimizes your footprint on the land. Uh, you can share lawn and outdoor recreation equipment. Um, this is one that people might not think about, but it's it's a pretty big one. You don't need to have two lawnmowers. You don't need to gas up two lawnmowers. You can share that. Um, and a big one for me is shared childcare. So, you know, I built my mom an ADU. Uh, my sister and I each have young children. They're, we have two-year-olds that are about a month apart, and my mom watches them. Um, and it's, it's great to have her right there. It makes it a lot easier. We don't have to drive to drop them off at daycare. It's huge. So there are these, there are these aspects of accessory dwelling units specifically, but even of, even if those were just neighbors, um, there are shared aspects of just having people denser, uh, that minimize your environmental impact. Um, this and is also financially too. I'm think like the financial impact of that, of when we think of childcare and vehicles and things. Absolutely. Exactly, Avril. Yeah, the financial impact of all that is almost as strong as the environmental uh, impact reduction. Um, and again, that's even if you just have a neighbor who's living in your backyard, you can still do shared lawn care, uh, shared storage space, um, a lot of that. Even shared child care, you know, you might, if you develop relationships with your neighbors, I don't know how many of you do. Uh, Jeff and I are both notorious for knowing everyone on the street and getting to know them and, you know, saying hi as we go down. Uh, but that can lead to shared child care and just good relationships, which is important this day and age. Um, so densification is great. All right. Um, next, I'm going to hop into heat pumps. So this was what our question was. We heat fully with heat pumps. The reason we do that is this first line. Heat pumps use electric. They're electric. They use electricity. Um, and they're up to 400% efficient. 400%. That means more than 100% efficient at uh, delivering heat. Um, compare that to if anyone has an, a, a classic furnace, which is either oil or natural gas or propane, typically those are between 83 and 96% efficient. What does that mean? Because that's what's important here. What that means is that for every unit of energy that you put into that furnace or this heat pump, um, if you are running a fossil fuel um, furnace, you are getting 83 to 96% of the energy back out. So if you have one BTU of propane that you're putting into your furnace, you're getting about 96% back out. Um, and it's 96% efficient. With a, with a heat pump, you're putting one kilowatt of energy in and in some cases at the right temperature, you're actually getting four BTUs or kilowatt. They, they can be used interchangeably somewhat uh, because they're measures of energy, but you can get four BTUs of energy out, four BTUs of heat energy in the best case scenario. Um, and that is why we use them. It's wild. And, and the reason that that can happen is not because they are creating more energy than they're using. That's impossible, um, at least in modern day physics, but they are actually stealing energy from the outside. They're compressing it and then bringing it to the inside of your home. So even at really cold temperatures, there is thermal energy in the air outside. And what a heat pump does is it runs a fan. It takes all that thermal energy 
It then um, compresses all that thermal energy in copper pipes, and then it runs another fan on the inside to blow that heat out at you. And that's how a heat pump works. It moves the heat. So you can think of it as moving the heat, all the heat outside to the inside. Similarly, when you're air conditioning in the summer, it's doing the opposite. It runs in the reverse direction. It takes all the heat inside your house and it moves it outside through those little coils. Um, and that's that point right there. Rather than creating thermal energy using electric resistors or burning fuel, heat pumps transfer energy from one location to another. Um, the other benefit of a heat pump is they can still be easily powered with a small generator or battery backup when the power goes out. I currently have two brothers with, uh, with heat pumps and they're both currently heating their house despite not having power from this last storm. Uh, and it, it, it has worked every storm they run. It's still super efficient. Um, they are, they're both using gas generators, but you, if you have a battery backup, um, or an EV that can send power back to your house, it can easily power the heat pump. Um, and it's an awesome choice. We have a heat pump question too. Um, can heat sure. pump systems be married to circulating water systems? Great question. Yes. Um, so there are air to water heat pumps. We use an air to air source heat pump. So it takes air from outside. It runs through coils, but then on the inside it's, it's air, it's forced air. Um, but if you have a traditional baseboard, um, system or you have any other kind of hydronic heat, so radiant heat, there are systems that take air from outside and they actually put it into hot water. They're called hydronic uh, systems and they they definitely have those um they started actually in the southeastern united states to be popular for heating pools and they've become more efficient where they have retrofit systems in the northeast and in places where it's colder uh, for people with baseboard or with radiators um they don't get hot enough to create steam so if you have a classic steam radiator system you won't be able to use a heat pump um but for uh lower temp systems um, you, you're able to use them like baseboard heat, which is pretty common in the Northeast. That's a great question. Because we're building new, um, I don't know how many of you love baseboard. I hate baseboard because it means you can't put furniture in that area of your room and um, it never seems to work right. It's, it works by convection. The idea behind it is great, but it never seems to work right. So we we don't put baseboard in our houses, even with a heat pump exchanger. We only do heat pumps, which is our forced air for our homes. Um, this is just a, a diagram showing basically what I just explained. Um, so. All right. The next part of our energy efficient mission is better insulation. So this is in an effort to reduce the heating load in our house or the cooling load, we wanna insulate more. It's a really easy way to do that. So all of our homes meet or exceed the prescriptive insulation requirements of the most recent International Energy Code. Unfortunately, the most recent International Energy Code is just now getting to the point of diminishing returns that I was talking about, at least in our zone. In other zones, because there are, I believe, seven energy zones in the US, um, in other energy zones, uh, they they have gotten there earlier because they're more temperate. Uh, but in Maine, we have very large swings in temperature. Um, so this point of diminishing returns, it just it took a little bit more. But we are just now getting there. Um, and so where we are in Maine, I'm in Portland. Uh, we insulate to a minimum of R60 in ceilings, and that's what's required actually now in the International Energy Code. And that's because that's the point of diminishing returns. And I'll show that on a graph next. That's where you no longer are seeing the benefit of adding more insulation. You've already added enough where it's so minimal, the heat loss after that, that it doesn't necessarily make sense from a cost perspective or from an embodied carbon perspective to add more insulation. Um, and then we insulate our walls with our 21 uh, dense pack fiberglass bat insulation. Um, with zip R on the outside, which is a continuous polyiso insulation um, for an R30. Uh, that is also in Portland, at least that's what code is, uh, R21 in many other places in Maine and Massachusetts, it's not quite that high yet, but in Portland, at least it's that high. And then we use uh, uh, ICF foundation forms that are insulated to R22 with EPS, um, which again, exceeds code. And our slabs are insulated with R10 
um, with two inches of XPS. So th those are a lot of numbers, but um, most of those numbers are based on the science of diminishing returns. So we know at that point, uh, we no longer adding more insulation doesn't make a big enough difference. Um, and I'll make a note about wall insulation that at some point you can insulate your walls really well, but if you still have windows and doors, windows and doors are so much worse at insulating uh, that it doesn't matter anymore. So we look at the whole envelope on all of our homes. We're doing what's called a HERS rating, which is an energy analysis. And, and we're taking all of that into account. The direction of the sun for passive solar heat gain um, and all of all of the elements. And, and you kind of have to do that. If you just look at one element, if you have R90 walls, but you have 150 windows in them, it, it doesn't matter that you have R90 walls. It doesn't matter. Um, so that is that. This is um, an example of diminishing returns, um, adding more insulation. So you can see the heat flow. And this is basically how much heat flow is flowing through a wall. It starts at um, 50 million mega BTUs. Um, but for this purpose, it starts at 50. And at the point you go down, you're adding more insulation. Uh, and that's the R value there. When you get towards about 16, it starts to get linear on a very small scale. And it's at seven and a half. As you get towards R30, which is where we're at, you're hovering right around uh, four. And, and if you get to 40, we're right around three. So you can see the diminishing returns that I was talking about there. As you get more insulation, it's just not really making as big of a difference. Um, and especially compared to upgrading windows or other things you can do, um, it doesn't make sense necessarily to, to upgrade the insulation in your walls. All right, that was a lot. So uh, any more questions right now before I move on not to more yet. topics? No, All right. Not yet. All right, so this is an actual HERS projection. Um, this is kind of the end of the analysis, um, what it looks like. This is, and this is only sheet one of, I think there's about 14 sheets when we do it. Um, but this is goes into a computer program that models everything in the energy usage. Um, and we wanted to show you this to show a couple of things. The big thing that I wanna show you is that heating and cooling only end up being about 33% of annual usage. Um, that's when you're building to code or better, which most people are, but that is pretty typical. And especially with heat pumps, we're only at 33% of usage, which means that 67% of the usage is actually not related to insulation or to air sealing or to the heating system at all. 67% of that is related to your lifestyle, uh, whether it be hot water heating, which you can see is a pretty big line item there, um, lights and appliances, um, dryers and washers. If you're, you know, if you have young kids and you're you're using the washer dryer all the time, those make a much larger impact on your overall energy usage in your home than heating and cooling, um, larger than 50%. A lot of people don't realize that because there's a huge focus when it comes to energy efficiency on let's make as tight a package as possible. And, um, you know, let's insulate all the walls and do really nice windows and make sure that we don't lose any heat. But at the end of the day, if you're using heat pumps and you're generally building to code, not even beyond code, your heating and cooling are only about 33% of your annual usage. Um, so it's interesting to see. Do you just have it's a question? Really interesting. Uh, yeah. Um, how do you handle non-vinyl siding installation over the R9 exterior rigid insulation over that material? And how do you install windows and doors properly? Great question. Uh, so we are using Zip R. Um, which has the OSB on the outside of the poly ISO. The poly ISO is directly against the stud. The OSB is on the outside. Um, we, we, you lose structural capacity when you do that, but with our, we're mostly building one or one and a half or two story buildings. We're able to design that in and um, our, our walls are still plenty strong enough. So uh, we have zip system. When we are doing wood siding, you need what's called a, a rain screen because wood needs to dry from both sides. And we accomplish that in a few different ways. Um, there are pre-made rain screens that are basically roll out. And for certain products that works. Um, so an example would be LP smart side, and which is a type of uh, wood siding can be used directly against um, one of those type of roll out rain screens. It has enough, it has about a quarter inch gap 
for air to get behind and dry it out. Um, if we are using something uh, like cedar shakes, um, which is pretty common in New England, we have to use uh, what's called cedar breather. And that creates more of like a five eighths inch gap. It looks like netting and webbing. And if we are using a um, a softwood or another hardwood type siding product like lap siding that's that's real wood, uh, we, we use three quarter inch furring strips and that creates an air gap behind our siding. So depending on what we're doing for siding, we definitely are thinking about that. And we are creating uh, what's called a rain screen, which allows condensation to come out of the wall cavity behind our siding and for air to convect up and dry the siding out so that it dries evenly and doesn't bow and doesn't rot over time. But that's a great question. And do you know if a person is in the Southeast, where can the products for heat pumps be located? Some things in the Southeast haven't made it down here yet. Do you know where those would be found? Yeah, so um, I, <laughs> I worked the first part of my structural engineering career in the Southeast, in, in the Carolinas. Um, and mini splits were just then becoming popular. Um, you're not gonna find them in Home Depot and Lowe's like you do in Maine, but you can find them at HVAC shops and order them. You can order them online. Um, and they are becoming increasingly more popular. So eventually you'll probably see them at Lowe's and Home Depot and off the shelf. But if you go to a, a an HVAC supply company or a plumbing supply company, you'd be able to find um, heat pumps. Just call around to your local ones. All right, I'm gonna keep moving here. All right, better air sealing. Um, so I just showed you one slide where I was telling you, hey, air sealing and... Uh, and insulation don't really matter as much. You know, they're only about 33% of your energy usage, but they, they do matter. You want to get to um, a certain level. Part of that is for heat loss. Part of that is for comfort. So the more air loss you have and the less insulation you have, you're just not as comfortable. If you're standing near an exterior wall, it gets a little breezy. And if anyone's ever lived in an old house, especially a farmhouse, you feel that, you know, you're warm next to the fireplace, but you're too warm, you're 95 degrees. And then you go next to the window and you're 40 degrees. Um, at least that was my experience growing up. Um, in a, in a well-sealed and well-insulated home, that's not the case. You're by the window and you're at 70 degrees. You're by the interior wall, you're at 70 degrees. Um, and, and it's, it's more balanced. So, uh, we do air seal and we think it's important and we think it's important for that reason, as well as for keeping indoor air quality good, which I'll talk about more um, at the end of this, but um, we'll start just by talking about it from a, uh, you know, comfortability level. So we try to reach an air sealing level of 1.5 ACH 50 in all of our homes. What that means is that when the home is depressurized to 50 Pascals, so we're basically sucking air out of the house. Um, and then we are measuring how many air changes happen per hour. So how much air is coming in from the outside to repressurize the house. Um, we use computer programs as well as a big fan to do that. Um, this puts us at near passive house level. So passive house is a German standard. Uh, it's kind of the green standard internationally all over the world. That's what people use for residences as kind of the green standard. And their level is 0.6 air changes per hour at uh, 50 pascals. And we're getting down to 1.5. Um, to give you some more reference points, uh, here are some more reference points here. Um, net zero ready homes. This is a qualification that the uh, US and Canada uses. This is actually a Canadian chart. You can see Ontario is referenced here, but that is a specific thing that they say net zero ready. And they're at one ACH 50. Um, there's a Canadian program called the R2000 program where people want to get to 1.5 ACH 50. Um, Energy Star version 12.6, that's a program that's also in the US. They want people to get down to 2.5 ACH 50. Um, in Massachusetts right now, so Maine does have has no qualifications for uh, air tightness. You're not required to get a blower door. There's actually a couple of municipalities that do require it. Uh, Saco is one that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, a few other ones, but generally Maine as a state does not have this. They don't require you to get a blower door at the end of your building. Massachusetts does. Massachusetts requires a 3.0 for any new building built, any new residence. Um, so that's where that comes from. The average modern home. So modern, we'd say built in the last uh, 
after the the housing drop off in 2008 is what we consider modern is around a 4.3 and the average overall um is is around a, a seven and a half um and even higher in the u.s this is canadian uh generally canadians build better i'll say that right now but uh <laughs> In the U.S., this number is actually closer to 12 or 14, really bad, um, the the air changes per hour. But again, we're at the bottom of the scale. We're reaching for 1.5. We do that because, again, that, that gets us to a point of diminishing return that we feel really comfortable with, both with air quality as well with heat loss and the comfortability of our homes. Um, and we feel really good about it. So that's where that number comes from. And maybe Jeff can speak to this, too, um, if there are programs um that reaching these numbers that you can qualify for different programs <clears throat> as far as financing and things go. Yeah, I know that there are some down in Massachusetts. Uh, I'm not as familiar with any of them up here in Maine. Um, Austin, you, you, you work in both states, you would know. Yeah, so Maine is working on a program based on this. Massachusetts already have one, has one. It's called Mass Saves. Um, it's actually a bunch of money from the um, from Eversource, which is one of the big electric suppliers down there, and some of the other um, utilities. They put a bunch of money into a pot each year, and that gets paid out to people if they build more efficient homes uh, so that they have less of an effect on the grid. Mm -hmm. um, and in mass, you can get up to uh, it's $17,500 for a new residence. Uh, that's if you get all the way down to a uh, one ACH 50 as well as meeting several other requirements for energy usage, a HERS rating of uh, below 40, I believe. And then there's a, a tier two where you get $15,000 if you're down below 1.5 ACH 50. Um, and that's our standard. So we get people down below that and they qualify for that. Um, and that also includes, I think you have to be at a, a HERS rating of 45 or less. So with HERS rating, the lesser the number, the better. So the higher the number, the closer you are to average. And the lower the number, the more efficient you are from a uh, energy use perspective. So good, good I know, question. Um, I know you answered this already, but there may have been some confusion of, um, is radiant heat possible with heat pumps? A great <laughs> question. Yeah. Yeah. They're called air to water source heat pumps. And again, they were commonly used in pools in the Southeastern United States and Southwest. And now they're being used um, in the Northeast with lower temps to do radiant heat. Um, and actually, our plumber and heating technician in Maine is building a house right now for himself, and uh, he's he's going to be putting that in. He's going to be doing an air to water source. We have never have. Um, I've seen them installed, um, but they are they're really cool. You can do radiant heat, which I know is is really comfortable and great. People love that. Um, also good if you have allergies and you don't like air blowing around your house. Um, radiant heat is nice, so it's it's a good option for sure. All right. Um, so I, I showed you that chart that 33% of our energy usage um, and our carbon footprint from a use perspective is heat, but the rest of that 67% is lifestyle. And that includes appliance energy use. And a big portion of it is appliance energy use. Um, so some things that we do to minimize that, one is utilizing a heat pump water heater. Uh, we try to use heat pump water heaters when, whenever we can. We build small. So if anyone's familiar with heat pump water heaters, you might know that they need about 700 cubic feet to operate properly and they're heat pumps. So they're stealing heat from the air to put into your water. So when they're inside your house, that means they're stealing heat from inside your house to put in your water. Um, that can work depending on the size of your house. If you have a basement, you can steal some ambient heat from the ground, it can work. Um, they also make ducted models uh, and we're using this more frequently where we are actually ducting the heat pump uh, to the outside. And so we're stealing heat for the air, air source water heat pump uh, from the outside. And uh, that works really well. Um, so that's uh, one thing we do. Another thing we do is for single occupants, which we do build for a lot, we use on-demand hot water heaters. Uh, on-demand hot water heaters require a lot of energy in the moment. But when you're a single occupant, instead of keeping a tank type hot water heater full all of the time, it just only produces hot water when you need it. Um, so that is a more efficient or can be a more efficient heating system when you're a single occupant. 
Um, and especially for older folks who might be showering only once every other day, um, you know, and they're doing dishes only once every other day, um, it can save a lot of energy. I will say above one occupant, it starts to become less efficient because it has a high energy load right off the bat. Um, and at that point, we'd want to switch to a heat pump water heater. Um, a heat pump dryer. I don't know if anyone's tried a heat pump dryer before. About five or six years ago, um, I tried one for the first time and it was garbage, to be honest. <laughs> they had just come out with it and it took four hours to dry the clothes and it was only like three, three and a half um, cubic feet of clothes drying. So you couldn't dry a blanket, but they are way better now. And most of our clients are installing heat pump dryers. Um, they're, you know, the same size as a modern dryer. You don't need to duct them outside. So you're not losing all that heat and, um, they're, they're really great. So heat pump dryers can save a ridiculous amount. And you can see, I even have, I don't have real numbers there, but, um, both of those appliances using heat pumps, they can cut your use in half. So a regular water heater compared to a heat pump, literally 50% of the energy usage. Same thing with a dryer, cutting down by 50%. So big, big differences. Um, so installing or planning for the installation of solar panels can not only reduce energy bills, but when paired with a battery backup system or an electric vehicle with two-way energy routing can reduce your reliance on the grid altogether. And we kind of talked about this um, and we do this planning for our houses is planning for the future. Um, you know, going to electric cars and going to all of these electric appliances, it is going to put more load on our grid. So it's important to consider that. Uh, but there are ways that you can buffer it. And a good way to buffer it is to plan for when you might need to buffer it, uh, which includes adding solar panels to your house um, when you can, or at least preparing for solar panels, uh, the possibility thereof, um, planning for electrical vehicle charging or a battery backup system, which we do in all of our houses. All right, this is another version of that chart um, or of that, you know, I noted it on the HERS rating, but this is uh, what a modern house is using. Um, and this was from 2021, so it's a little bit older, but it's pretty accurate. So space heating uh, or heating your home, 31%. Um, this also includes furnace fans and boiler circulation pumps, 1.1. So it adds up to about 33%, like I was noting. Water heating, you can see how huge that is but you can cut that down by more than 50% um, by going with a heat pump hot water heater. This is traditional. Um, cooling is, is less, um, but still uh, using a heat pump can cut that down. And you can see all these other things. They're all lifestyle things, refrigeration, uh, washers, dishwashers, home entertainment and equipment, lighting, all of those little things add up to be big. Um, you know, 67% of our use adds up um, and this is overall energy use. So this includes, um, in a, in a, in a modern house, it could include propane or natural gas fueled things. So it's overall energy use, but in all, in our all electric homes, it, it would be a similar graph. All right. Um, this is kind of, uh, I want to show you this because this is this is how we build our foundations. Uh, the reason we build this way is uh, for Im the Im purpose of embodied carbon. So it's also for cost reduction, but it's it reduces our embodied carbon by a lot. Um, this is what's called a frost protected crawl space or frost protected um, foundation. This is a code foundation. Looks weird. People think it looks weird. Uh, it's been used in Canada and in Europe for years. Um, like decades. Uh, it's been used in the US and is a prescriptive foundation. We have revamped it to use ICFs, to use a single pour of concrete um, and to work for our homes. But what this allows us to do is, um, sorry, the following. We are able to reduce our concrete usage from 28 yards of concrete for a typical crawl space that would have a frost wall you might be more familiar with to 16 yards of concrete. So a huge reduction um, in concrete. You know, it's a 75% increase if we were gonna do a traditional frost wall. Uh, we're able to use fewer sheets of XPF S insulation. So if we were to insulate a standard frost wall per code, we'd need 42 sheets. And with our foundation, we're only using 37. Um, 
And it, the other thing that it does is it reduces cost. So there's a cost associated with concrete. Uh, there's a cost associated with doing multiple pours of concrete and doing various things on a traditional uh, system. You know, it, putting foam against the walls of the of the foundation is another step that has to be done. So we're able to reduce our cost um, and reduce our time, which also has a carbon impact. Um, so I, I wanted to quickly go over this. We're not gonna get into it too much, um, any of the technical aspects, but we are able to reduce a lot of our impact by going with this foundation system. It also reduces our digging, the amount of digging that we have to do, which is nice. Um, and it's an engineered system. So we actually take the facts and we engineer a system with a subgrade and a subbase that works rather than traditionally you dig a hole, you hope that the dirt is right and you throw some concrete in there. And if you have settling in a couple of years, it's like, ah, I guess we'll just have to deal with it. Um, but we combat that by using an engineered system. Um, all right. So this, this next aspect, um, Actually, this is perfect. Uh, we have a question that is there a problem in the summer with dampness if you open windows? Uh, that's that's a good question. So um, relative humidity is a, a really important aspect of homes in general. But if you have warmer air, you can fit a lot more humidity into it. Um, that's the nature of uh, gases, which air is a gas. Um, the warmer they are, you can fit a lot more moisture into it. The colder they are, less moisture, which is why in the winter, a lot of people run humidifiers in their homes so that they don't get chapped lips and they don't get sore throats. Uh, it's because you can't fit as much humidity in there. In our homes, we use what's called energy recovery ventilation. So energy recovery ventilators, ERVs, um, which basically exchange air from the outside and the inside through a core where they don't uh, actually touch each other, but they pass off the energy and the humidity um, so that the inside of your home stays super comfortable. You don't lose the humidity that your body creates in the winter time. Um, and you also don't lose uh, too much of the heat. It's about 94 to 96% efficient, uh, depending on the house. Um, it also has really intense filters. Um, we use MERV 12 filters, but you can use a higher grade of filter in a lot of these. And it's filtering out allergens and other basic pollutants to provide a really healthy indoor air quality environment. Um, and it effectively maintains a balanced humidity level. So to speak to your humidity question, in the winter time, it's going to keep humidity in that your, your body creates when you shower to keep the right humidity level so that your skin and you stay healthy. And in the summer, it's gonna do the opposite. It's gonna balance that humidity so that the humidity outside and the much warmer air of the outside stays there and the inside humidity stays at a comfortable level. Um, it's a really cool piece of equipment. Uh, this is how it works. Um, and this is kind of complicated, but the big thing is, is that it takes air from the outside, air from fresh air from the outside, stale air from the inside. So air that you've been breathing, it sucks that in. It passes it over, um, shoots out the stale air, all of the CO2 that you've created, all of the pollutants, um, and takes in the nice fresh oxygen from the outside, filters it. So if there's any pollutants or pollen in there and then brings in that fresh air tempered so that it's at the right temperature of the inside and also at the right humidity. Um, so this is a super crucial part of our homes. We build tight. So our air, you know, our air changes are so few that if you didn't have these lungs, you would need the windows open all the time to get oxygen, even with a small amount of occupants. Um, or you would, or, or you would start to feel it. You would feel the stale air. Um, I always make the joke that you, you know, you cook a fish dinner and you smell it three weeks later, that, it, that would be the case without an energy recovery later, uh, ventilator, because you, there are not enough air changes, um, to actually take that smell out. Uh, so with the energy recovery ventilator, it keeps your house smelling fresh and feeling fresh all the time. So it's super important. These are very easy to use too, right? They, you just flip a switch and they leave them on. You don't have to touch it. There's not maintenance of switching. You know, in the summertime, I have to do this. In the winter, I have to do this. You just leave it on and it's it does the right thing. Great, great question, Jeff. Yeah. Um, just like with a heat pump, it's really set it and forget it. Um, and I should have mentioned that with heat pumps too. With a traditional furnace, you know, you change your temperature 
when you go to sleep because you're going to save energy. With a heat pump, it's actually more efficient just to keep it at the right temperature all the time with a well-insulated house. ERV is the same thing. You're going to leave it on all the time. It has a very low wattage fan that uses about $20 worth of electricity a year. Um, there is a boost mode. So if you're having a party, if your family's over for Thanksgiving or you're uh, enjoying some dinner, you can turn that on the boost mode and it will work a lot faster to exchange the air. It'll be a little bit less efficient in that boost mode, but um, it'll be more, it'll clean the air faster. Um, but otherwise you don't have to touch it. You could leave it on regular mode for uh, the entire year and never even think about it. It's silent. The air moves very slowly and it's silent. So it's not like a uh, hood fan above your stove where you hear it really loudly or a bathroom fan where it's loud. You, It's silent. You don't hear it at all. Um, great question, Jeff. All right. The final thing I want to get into uh, that is important for energy efficiency and, and, you know, thinking about the earth is water usage. So, um, there's two things associated with water. One is that we have a limited supply of fresh water in the world. You see that on the West Coast uh, where they literally run out of water sometimes and they have to go. Um, towns will tell people you can't shower, you can't water your lawn today. Uh, we, we see that less um, when we're in Maine. Um, just in the Northeast, we have more water and fewer people. But so that's the first part is we, do, we have a limited supply of fresh water. But the other part of it. Uh, is unless you're on a well, which a lot of people are, if you're on municipal water, it takes a ridiculous amount of energy to clean that water and make it fit for use. Um, and that energy is super important to your carbon footprint and to uh, energy efficiency. So I wanted to show people this because this, this is wild to me. Uh, you don't think about all the water that you drink um, or use for your homes but this is one person uses 136 gallons of water in 24 hours. And that, that's just for their use. That's not taking into account the products that they use and the amount of water it goes into creating the products that they use, which is also a large amount of water. Um, so saving water um, is super important, even on a per person basis because if you can save even 20 of those gallons by taking a shorter shower or not watering your lawn um, and, and maybe using rain barrels instead or whatever it is you can save a, a lot of water um, so important to think about uh, I'm going to talk about this in ways that we combat water conservation some things that we do in our houses um, we use super efficient uh, flush toilets so we are using traditional toilets, but they are the most efficient that you can get and still operate. Uh, we're using super efficient shower heads uh, that are super low flow, but still provide what feels like good pressure. Um, finding and repairing leaks. A single leak can be like 500 gallons of water over the course of a year, even just a single dripping leak. So it's really important to make sure that you take care of your leaks. Um, and obviously we are building houses that uh, are not leaking, so that's important. Um, energy saving faucets are another way. And then using energy efficient um, washing machines as well as dishwashers. Uh, dishwashers generally, I think use like three or four gallons for a load. But if you're running your faucet, which runs at between a half a gallon per minute and two and a half gallons per minute, depending on the type of faucet you have, you can easily run through that amount of water in, in three dishes. So utilizing your dishwasher is actually saving energy in houses. Um, a lot of people don't realize that even though it uses electricity, it's gonna overall save energy because you are not using as much water. Um, watering plants during the coolest part of the day um, and trying to stay away from, staying away from hosing things down all, the, all of the time. We have a water question too. Um, do we install gray water systems? <clears throat> Great question. Um, we are having we we have had this question a lot, and uh, I would love to have a municipality approve a gray water system. Um, we have not had one yet. We've had questions about composting toilets and gray water systems, so we have not installed gray water systems before. Um, there are systems where we can filter, uh, you know, certain water to use for flushing toilets. Um, 
And we've looked into those for a couple of clients. They basically would sit in the crawl space and they would just have a very basic filter. So from the laundry or from a hand washing sink, you could filter that water and use it for flushing toilets. Uh, but we have not installed one. It, it would be great. It's a great way to save energy and to save water. Um, but to be honest, no, we have not installed one at this point. A lot of that is municipal approval. I don't know of a single municipality who actually approves uh, gray water systems. Um, I, I will say, actually, I designed a house in uh, in Hawaii once where it was actually required and they had a really cool gray water system. So I think because Hawaii has so much less water, they allow it. But in Maine, municipalities just don't, they don't have to think about water as much. So unfortunately, no, we haven't. Or Maine and Massachusetts. Um, we have another question I'll answer real quick. How do you deal with makeup air from range hoods during cooking? Uh, great question. So uh, we try to push recirc uh, hoods, good research hoods as much as possible. Um, if not, we need makeup air system. So there's two ways we can do that. One is ERVs that can be unbalanced. So for the most part, we're using balanced ERVs, which means we have the same flow of air from the outside. Um, coming from the outside is going out from the inside, but they also make unbalanced ERVs uh, that can be switched along with a range hood um, so that when your range hood goes on and it's sucking air out, your ERV can pull more air in than it's actually pulling out. Um, and that's the best way for makeup air because it's conditioning that air. A traditional makeup air system, if people aren't familiar, basically is just a big fan that pulls in unconditioned air from the outside. So as you're pulling air uh, with your stove, you don't create a vacuum in your house. So it pulls air out and also pulls air in. Um, but yeah, our ERVs uh, in some of our homes, where we need that, we can unbalance our ERVs so that when the stove goes on, uh, it pulls in more air. It goes from 40 CFM to 140 CFM to bring that in. Um, we have not we have not installed a commercial hood uh, that is above um, 300 CFMs, which is kind of the the limit of where it becomes commercial, uh, it, more commercial, and you really need a big makeup air system. Um, we're typically below that and we encourage people. We're also, we're not installing propane stoves. We do all electric homes. So it's a, it's less required to be honest. A great question though. Um, all right, that is it for me at this time. April, how are we doing on time? We are um, over. I mean, we started five minutes late so we're kind of right on time here. Um, I guess I'll give the opportunity if anyone does have some last minute questions to throw in there, we can answer one or two. Um, and up here, Austin has um, Jeff and Tim's contact information. So if you are in Maine, you would contact Jeff. Um, in Massachusetts, reach out to Tim. And that's with any questions. Um, yep. That could be related to what we are talking about tonight, or it could be a completely um, different question as well. Um Let's do this last question here. Uh, what about fireplaces or wood stoves? Yeah, great question. Um, we we have had people install fireplaces or wood stove. I think in Maine and Massachusetts, especially rural Massachusetts, it's just really nice to have. Um, when we do that, we have to use um, outside air intakes because our houses are so tight that they would burn up all the oxygen really quickly. And our houses are also small. Uh, so uh they typically have um an outside air intake that comes into the back that takes the oxygen and the air from the outside to actually burn with the wood to go out uh but yeah people we install wood stoves in our house uh they end up being a pretty big air leakage source unless they're super high quality um and in most of our homes that have them they're very small wood stoves um in fact my own house which is a relatively small house i have a small wood stove in it but you put two logs in it and light it on fire and the house is 90 degrees three minutes later because it's so tight. You know, my house is built to the same standard as all of back your day to use. Um, but yeah, I love the coziness of it and my wife loves the coziness of it and it's definitely something that we do. Great. Well, that's all the questions. Jeff, did you have anything um, that you wanted to add? Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, thank you for everybody watching and joining us tonight. Um, and as you can see here, my information and Tim O'Reilly's information is on here. Anything energy related or just generally ADU um, or backyard ADU related, um, 
feel free to reach out to us. We love answering questions. We love talking with folks um, and helping them get what they what they need and helping them along the process. So, um, yeah. Okay. Um, in two weeks, too, we are starting a new um, virtual event series where we're going to be going through um, different size ADUs and looking at different models of that. Um, so those will be up on Monday of next week. Um, if you want to hop on um, in the same place wherever um, you signed up here, um, most likely on Eventbrite. Um, and then the recording again will be available next Thursday at the latest. And again, stay tuned for that email tomorrow. Um, I'm going to throw in some of our handouts on ERVs and heat pumps um, and some of the blog posts that we have too that kind of um, go a little deeper in some of the stuff that Austin talked about tonight. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone. Yeah, thanks thank Austin. You, everyone. Thanks, thanks for listening. Yeah, have a good night, good everybody. Job,